Hello everyone. Since Sailor Moon is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year, I decided to take a break from Power Rangers and Super Sentai and instead talk about the one time that Sailor Moon had a live action toku adaptation. Live action adaptations of popular media have been attempted since the birth of film as a medium. While there are aspects of spectacle from a comic or manga that can only be replicated in animation, there's just something about seeing these characters and costumes come to life in live action. While we've seen an uptick in live action anime adaptations this past decade, they have always been around. And just like with superhero movies, some are good, some are bad, and some are just confusing. 2003's Bishoujo Senshi Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon is one that I was fully prepared to put into the what the f pile. But you know what? I actually enjoyed it. I would even say that it's superior to the anime in some respects. If you're like me and you saw pictures of the cast and costume, you probably weren't all that impressed. This show is actually one of the reasons I've tried to be less judgmental about appearance and aesthetic in Toku. Like, I understand if you're turned off by all this, but I guarantee if you give this show a fair chance, it might surprise you. Also, spoiler alert, the show is almost 20 years old, but spoiler alert anyway for people who care. One of the factors that contributed to Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon being greenlit by Toei was a series of popular musicals that ran from about 1993 to 2005. I can't really go into detail on these because I haven't really had the time to watch too many of them. But there was one where Yuta Mochizuka, or Red Toronto from Jew Ranger, was Tuxedo Common. So that's neat. When looking at the costuming for Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon, it's easy to see how the musicals influenced its production. It's pretty common for actors and actresses to wear wigs in live shows when representing characters with unique hairstyles and colors. When I was watching clips of the musicals, the wigs didn't really bother me. Even with cameras, you don't ever see the characters up close. In general, stage performers rely a lot more on body movement to express emotion than TV or film performers because even audience members in the front row can barely see their facial expressions. This is not true of television. The camera is much closer to the performers' faces, which allows them to give more subtle and intimate portrayals of their characters. This also means that the wigs look really weird when you first see them in the show's intro. It's just, ah, your brain just floods you with warning signs that what you're seeing isn't real. On some level, the production staff had to be aware of this because, unlike the musicals, the sailor soldiers only have their wigs when transformed. So, for most of an episode, you will see them with their natural hair. Unfortunately, it's not just the costumes where the spectacle is a bit lacking. The choreography of the fight scenes is also just... okay. It does get better as the show goes on, but I have a hard time remembering most of the fights in this show. There's also horrible CG Abomination Luna. I imagine that they didn't want to pay the cost of training a cat and didn't want to risk a cat's safety on set. And so Luna is a plushie that turns into a creepy CG monster whenever she moves. I'm also guessing that the production team realized partway through filming how horrible this looked. And so after about 10 episodes, Luna is just entirely a puppet. She eventually gets a sailor transformation, replacing Chibiusa, and overall just is easier to manage and looks better than either the puppet or CG. On the plus side though, they managed to snag Keiko Han, the original voice actress from the anime, to reprise her role in this show. So probably by now you're wondering why I said I liked this show earlier. Well, it's because I actually like the story and characters. Spectacle Without Meaning is still pretty, and it still has value, but it fades like a cherry blossom from memory. The shows and cartoons that stick with kids forever are more than just spectacle. Fans of Dragon Ball remember fast-paced punches and beam fights, but they also remember Piccolo's sacrifice. They remember Goku getting heartbroken when Krillin died. Twice! 
Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon is a failure in terms of captivating spectacle. But in some ways, it outshines the original anime and how it presents its story. I have never been much of a Sailor Moon fan. My older brother was really into it when I was younger, and I didn't get it. As the youngest of four boys, I was a little sensitive about my masculinity and avoided media aimed directly at girls for a long time. While I have watched most of the original anime, it was something I did with my brother and I never had much personal attachment to it. I did watch a good chunk of Crystal when it started airing, and it was fine. The reason I decided to watch the live-action version was because the head writer was Yasuko Kobayashi. For those of you who don't know, Kobayashi has been the head writer of a number of acclaimed toku shows, including some of my favorite series, Kamen Rider's Oz and Denno, as well as Resha Sentai Tokyuger. I've talked about Kobayashi before in previous vids, and so I won't go into detail. Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon came out a year after Ryuki, which means that Kobayashi would have had to go to work on it immediately once Ryuki was wrapped up. I've heard that the manga's original author, Naoko Takeuchi, was more involved with the live-action series than the anime, but I couldn't find specific information on how. The live-action series is a 49-episode adaptation of the Dark Kingdom arc, which is the best arc in my opinion. It's the only one I really remember, and I started losing interest in Crystal during the time travel shenanigans arc. The plot starts off fairly similar to the anime, but then departs very sharply partway through, especially when Usagi is revealed to be the Moon Princess. Before we get into that though, we need to talk about the individual sailors themselves. Since the live-action series had a smaller budget to work on and couldn't afford bombastic fight scenes like the anime, this meant that a lot more time was spent on the interpersonal relationships and dramas of the sailors themselves. Amy isn't defined as being just the smart girl. Her life has been a lonely one consisting of devotion to studying. Because of this, she's the one who values the sailors as a friend group more than the others. This is what partially leads her into being turned into Dark Mercury, and while that plot arc lasts way too long, watching the other sailors realize they had taken Amy's and their own friendships for granted is much more palpable than anything they did with Amy in the original anime. They also actually show Amy's relationship with her mother. Amy's mom, while caring and supportive, is incredibly controlling. One of Amy's greatest difficulties is standing up to her mother to express that she wants friends and needs more in her life than just studying. Amy is not the only character with a fleshed-out relationship with her parents. Rey has a whole backstory where her dad is an important politician who she's estranged from because she feels he abandoned his family while her mom was dying of a vague, undefined illness. Keiko Kitagawa nails all her performances. An abrasive character like Rey can be difficult to play. In the anime, I just thought Rey was kind of rude most of the time. Keiko's Rei, while harsh, is also vulnerable and hurt, and allowed me to relate to the character in a way I never had before. Makoto is one of the Sailor Scouts that remains without parents. The episode that introduces her is easily one of my favorites of the entire series. Makoto rescues Usagi from bullies in a sequence that is honestly more badass than most of the show's actual fights, and we learn that while she's tough, she has a very feminine side to her. Since the bullies can't beat her in a fight, they try to hurt her with a fake love note. And again, we get a stellar performance from Miyu Izama. The girls agree that this is an appropriate situation to abuse their powers and humiliate the bullies at basketball. Everything about this sequence is perfect. Even after all this, though, Makoto struggles with being a loner. She even turns down the advances of the lovable turtle guy, a friend of Mamoru's who has made up for this show. She does so because she feels that she just needs to be alone. But it turns out that she was lying to herself because she's scared of being close to people. While it's nothing groundbreaking, I still connected with the character much more in this show than I did the original anime. I don't even remember what Jupiter's plot arc in the anime was. The Sailor Scout who departs the most from her original version, though, is Minako. Minako is a character I struggle with a bit. I don't dislike her, but she comes into the show so late it's hard to connect with her. 
The live-action series fixes this by having Minako be a famous pop idol. Sailor V is also mentioned in news reports. This means that Minako feels like a part of the show, even before her character becomes more central to the story. Minako pretends to be the Moon Princess to protect Usagi while she hasn't awakened. I don't remember how long this plot arc is in the anime, but in Crystal it's only about two episodes or so. In the live-action series, it is a lengthy part of the story. Normally, I'm against dragging out plot arcs, but the live-action show uses it as a way to add drama with her relationships to other characters, especially Mars. Minako, as it turns out, has a rare, vaguely defined illness that will kill her. Kobayashi just had a real thing with this trope in the 2000s. She can get surgery, but the chances of that succeeding are very slim, so Minako knows she's on borrowed time. So while she's pretending to be the Moon Princess, she's trying to get all the other sailors to awaken their powers and mold Mars into a leader so that when it's time for her to die, she knows the team will be able to survive without her. Minako is convinced to undergo the surgery, and she doesn't make it. I was shocked when this happened, especially because it's not a big melodramatic moment. She just waves goodbye, leaves, and then isn't seen again. Ray's the one who has to break the news to everyone who have gathered together for a party. I've never really lost someone important to me, but I feel like this is closer to what happens in reality. Most of the time, you don't get to say goodbye in a dramatic death scene. They're just gone, and all you have is the memory of the last time you saw them. Minako does come back to life at the end thanks to the deus ex machina, but this is still a powerful moment that I'm surprised they did on a kid's show. I'm going to skip Tuxedo Mask because as far as I can tell, he's more or less the same in every adaptation. The biggest change with him in the live action show is his relationship to the Shikano, which I'll get to. You'll probably notice that I haven't talked at all about the series title character, Usagi. That's intentional. You see, the changes made to Usagi are some of the biggest and most important to the overall plot and story, so we'll circle back to Usagi and Sailor Moon after I'm done talking about the villains. The original anime didn't go far into Beryl's past, so before Crystal came out, this version of Beryl was actually more faithful to the source material in the sense that the main motivation for her actions was an unrequited love for Andymion, or Mamoru. One thing that Beryl does in this show that is unique from the other adaptations is to create a human shadow of herself to torment Usagi. Unfortunately, the school turning on Usagi was something that they already did during the Dark Mercury arc, and while it is done much better here, I was already tired of that conflict. Aya Sugimoto does a great job in the role. The trap of characters like Beryl is that, because she's so over the top and wears a silly outfit, Actresses playing her would be very tempted to just go overboard with their acting. While Sugimoto is big and dramatic, there's always a serious earnestness with how she delivers her lines that really helps sell Beryl's bitterness at losing Endymion to Serenity, but also the loneliness and isolation she feels. Despite a few things here and there, Beryl is mostly the same character she is from the anime. The Shitano, on the other hand, are very different characters. Zoe Sight is the first to remember his past life and actively tries to help Mamoru even as Beryl uses her powers to exert control over him. There is even an episode where he and Minako make a deal to separate Mamoru and Usagi since neither of them approve of the relationship. In the original anime, he and Kunzite were in a relationship. This is why in the original dub of the anime, his gender was changed to female. In the original manga, and in Crystal, he had been lovers with Mercury in a past life. For the live-action series, they dropped the plotline of the Shitano and the Sailor Senshi being in relationships with each other in past lives. I prefer this change. Accepting Mamoru and Usagi being in a relationship when Usagi is only about 15 is already pushing it for me. I really like Zoicide in the live-action series. He learns fairly quickly about his past life as a retainer to Endymion, and spends most of the series at odds with Beryl and the other Shitano as he tries to help and protect his former master. 
Nephrite is very different in all his incarnations. In the original anime, he forms a relationship with Naru, which does not exist in either the manga, live-action series, or Crystal. Nephrite in the live-action series is the most impulsive of the Shiteno. He's actually turned human for a while and works at the karaoke place that the sailors use as their base. They kind of start a weird thing between him and Mercury, which ends up going nowhere. I'm mixed on that because while some of the scenes they have together are cute, Mercury's actress is underage. They all are. Minako's actress is the oldest at around 17. Jedite starts off very similar to his manga and anime counterparts. He is the first of the Shiteno to be introduced and is the first to be defeated. The significant point of departure from the manga and the anime is that when Jedite is defeated, it's not the end of him. Jedi comes back later in the series. Both he and Nephrite refuse to believe Zoisite when he tries to tell them the truth about their past lives. Jedi does eventually remember who he is, but instead of returning to Endymion, he decides to stay with Beryl. As the castle of the Dark Kingdom is collapsing all around them, he realizes that the affection he felt for Beryl was his own and chooses to die with her. Jedi and Beryl, both suffering from unrequited love, easily makes the live-action version of Jedi my favorite. Kunzite in all the mediums is the last of the Shiteno to be introduced. In the live-action show, he is actually living his life as a normal human until Beryl decides to awaken him. He is also the first Shiteno to turn a human into a Yoma. When Kunzite is introduced is the first time the stakes feel raised in a significant way. What makes Kunzite scary isn't his power level or some such bullshit, it's his ruthlessness. He doesn't care about turning people into monsters. He's also the one responsible for kidnapping Mercury and turning her evil. Unlike Nephrite and Jedite, Kunzite is aware of his past life as one of Endymion's retainers. The reason he chooses to fight for the Dark Kingdom is because he feels betrayed. Endymion knew that his relationship with Princess Serenity would cause catastrophe, but chose to prioritize his love over his people. Kunzite refuses to forgive Endymion for this. It's not until the final arc of the show, where Mamoru takes Metallia's powers into himself, that Kunzite is able to acknowledge him and forgive his old master. Overall, I really enjoyed the villains in the live-action series. I would say I even liked them a little bit better in the anime. That's not saying that the villains in the anime are bad, it's just that in the live-action series, I really like how each member of the Shitano not only has a unique relationship with Queen Beryl, but also with Endymion. It makes the backstabbing and the internal drama just much more interesting. Well, with everything else out of the way, it's finally time to talk about the star of the show herself, Sailor Moon, or Usagi. At first, Usagi is pretty similar to her manga and anime counterparts. She's an airhead who is not very smart, but is kind-hearted and loyal to her friends. The biggest initial change is that Usagi's father is barely present in the show, giving her mother a much larger role. I love Usagi's mom. In general, eccentric mom seems to be a toku character type that is becoming one of my favorites and I would love it if these types of characters were a bit more common. About halfway through the show, Usagi gets a power up which changes everything. Her increased power comes from the old princess Serenity taking over her body. It is also revealed that the Silver Crystal, which is the source of Usagi's power, is what is giving Queen Metallia power and allowing her to grow stronger. We also learn that it was not Queen Metallia that destroyed the Old World and the Moon Kingdom. Princess Serenity, when she saw the dead body of Prince Endymion, was so full of pain and rage that she unleashed her full power and just killed everyone. She also admits that she'll gladly do it again if Endymion or Mamoru dies again. One of the things I love about Kobayashi as a writer is how she incorporates tropes of tokusatsu into her narratives. In Time Ranger, the villains put off growing huge because they're criminals who want to live an easy life, which they can't do as giants. In Go Busters, they work for a government organization, which has to get its Enatron supply from the government, meaning that it's in their best interest not to use the super duper big mecha combinations if they don't have to. I love that in Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon, the power-up which allows Usagi to fight the stronger Yoma comes at such a high price. 
It means that the characters have to try and find a way to solve their problems without using it, and actively discourage Usagi from channeling Princess Serenity if she doesn't have to. But more important, the way this is done adds a lot of depth to Usagi's character. In the original anime, the impression is that since Usagi is a reincarnation of Serenity, they were basically the same person. But in the live action show, Miyu Saiwa does a damn good job and shows off her range. While Usagi is carefree, Serenity is weary and broken from the responsibilities of being a princess. In the end, Mamoru sacrifices himself to stop Queen Metalia. Seeing Endymion die a second time triggers Princess Serenity to go and destroy the world again. The climax of the anime involves Usagi fighting Queen Metalia in a spectacle of a battle that rivals the best fights of Dragon Ball. The live action show I'm pretty sure did not have the budget to pull this off, which results in the drastic change at the end. Instead of a laser fight of the century, we just have Princess Serenity walk to a space and, with a solemn expression, destroy the world she no longer wants to be a part of. We get a reset button ending, which Kobayashi also did in Ryuki. I'm not the biggest fan of that trope, but I can understand not wanting to end Sailor Moon on a bummer. And it is still faithful to the original story, which also involved everyone dying and coming back to life later. This isn't a perfect show. And the truth is, I'm not sure if it would be high on my list of recommendations for people. But there is enough to satisfy any Toku fan. And if you're a fan of Sailor Moon who hasn't seen it, it's worth checking out at least. I went into this show expecting to watch five or so episodes, give up, and then laugh at how corny and stupid it was. But I genuinely enjoyed my time with this odd little gem. It deserves to have an official subtitle release and be as legally available as the anime. Well, that's all for now. Till next time. May the power protect you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe, and also consider watching some of my other videos. The thumbnail was provided by Buster Bluey. You can follow her on Twitter and YouTube using the links below in the description.